All right, guys. Well, welcome to week nine. This week we're studying learning. We're going to focus on classical conditioning, talking about Pavlov, B.F. Skinner, and his operant conditioning, all these wonderful, amazing topics that are all over AP exams. So let's get started. So what is learning? It is any relatively permanent change in behavior brought about by experience or practice. So anytime you've sat in a classroom, of course that's learning. Anytime you have made friends and you've negotiated conversations, you've learned what to say, what not to say, that's also kind of learning. It's anything that changes your behavior in any way. So it's not always formalized like it is in classrooms. It's personal relationships. It's learning how to get dressed. It's everything. So the first type of conditioning that we're going to study is classical conditioning. Classical conditioning is done by Ivan, uh, Ivan Pavlov. He is a Russian physiologist who is going to study how draw, uh, dogs drool. And he is going to see that by he can train dogs to respond respond with a physical response by um, doing a ringing a bell at a certain time. So what is classical conditioning? Classical conditioning is learning to make a reflex response to stimulus other than the original natural stimulus that normally produces the reflex. Keep in mind, when we're talking about classical conditioning, we're talking about eliciting a response or doing something without thinking about it. So what is classical conditioning? Now the first thing is the unconditioned stimulus. Now this is something that naturally occurs in nature that people naturally respond to without any type of uh, conditioning. So in Pavlov's very famous experiment, which you do need to know in its entirety for the exam, is um, unlearned or naturally occurring. And this one would be salivating to the smell of food. So food is your unconditioned stimulus. Now your unconditioned response is the involuntary response to a naturally occurring or unconditioned stimulus. So it is your reaction to something that you have had no training in. So if a dog smells food, its unconditioned response is to start drooling. No one trained the dog to do that. Okay, It is a very, very natural response. So when a dog smells food, okay, so the unconditioned stimulus, it triggers a response of drooling. So the next is the conditioned stimulus. What makes classical conditioning different from anything else is that we are going to take an a neutral stimulus or something that triggers no response and we're going to condition it to or may learn or teach the dog that this stimulus means something different. So a conditioned stimulus in this example would be the bell. So before conditioning began the bell means nothing to the dog. However, once we ring the bell and condition it over months of time. Every time we ring the bell and we present food, the dog is going to begin drooling at the sound of a bell and not at the smell of food. So we're going to condition the dog to see or anticipate or elicit a response of drooling when we see when he hears the bell. So when we talk about condition, it's a learned response. It's when a neutral stimulus can become a conditioned stimulus when paired with an unconditioned stimulus. So the conditioned response is that is a learned reflex in response to a conditioned stimulus. What that means is, is we're going to condition the dog to, every time he hears a bell, to drool to the bell and not to the sound, to smell of food after a while. And we've taken unconditioned stimulus, like food, and we've made it a, con uh, un a conditioned response of drooling to the sound of a bell, which is pretty cool. So, before conditioning, the bell triggers no response. During conditioning, the bell is presented with food to the dog, and then the dog is going to drool. After conditioning, the bell is going to trigger a conditioned response of drooling all on its own. Now, when we're talking about classical conditioning concepts, we need to know that there are a few basic principles. The conditioned stimulus must be prevented for the unconditioned stimulus. The conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus must be very closely together in time. So, what we need to do is make sure that one thing happens immediately after the next. Then finally, a neutral stimulus must be paired with the unconditioned stimulus several times, often many times before conditioning can take place. So we have to make sure that we're laying these types of foundations. And then finally, the conditioned stimulus is usually some stimulus or distinctive that stands out from competing stimuli. Which means, if you're going to condition your dog, you can't condition them doing the same thing or you have to do it something a little bit different. So, classical conditioning concepts are going to be based on 
stimulus generalization. Now, one of the most, uh, what that means is, is if I've been conditioning the dog with the same bell and I use a different bell for the first time, that is called stimulus generalization. It's a tendency to respond to a stimulus that only one is similar. So me in class using three different bells. If the dog responds to every single bell, that's called stimulus generalization. Stimulus dis discrimination is only responding to the high-pitched bell even though the other bells sound like a bell. So stimulus discrimination is the tendency to stop making a generalized response to a stimulus that is similar to the original, okay? So it is when they stop, they don't respond to any type of stimulus that is similar. Now extinction is the disappearance or the weakening of a learned response following the removal. Now if I condition my dogs to drool at the sound of a bell and then I do not I ring a bell around my dogs for a year or two, and then I ring a bell, and the dogs never respond. That's called extinction. Okay, so during conditioning, the strength of the generalized response is going to be at its highest as it go as time elapses past conditioning. We're going to see that it is going to get weaker and weaker and weaker, and eventually lead to extinction. Now, some other major concepts is spontaneous recovery. If I condition my dogs to drool at the sound of a bell, and I ring the bell maybe six or eight months later, and the dog may have a little bit of a drool coming to the sound of a bell, that would be a spontaneous recovery. It's typically a relatively permanent change conditioning. It doesn't mean it's always going to stay that way. And higher order conditioning is when eventually when you do a double compound. So instead of just ringing the bell to present food, you ring a bell, you do a clappy thing, and then you present the food. Eventually, the higher order conditioning will eventually dissipate, and it will only take the bell or the clappy thing to trigger the food. But higher order means it's a compound signal. Okay. Now, um, with extinction spontaneous recovery, we're going to see that eventually it will fade out with time. Okay? So, high order conditioning is when we prevent multiple things at one time. We do a and then eventually causes. Now, conditioned emotional response is an emotional response that has become classically conditioned to occur to learn stimuli. What that means is it's the foundation for all of our phobias and fears that a certain trigger elicits a certain response from you. So um, for me, I absolutely hate milk. Anytime someone says I have to drink a thing of milk and really grosses me out, the same thing with mayo, really grosses me out. So what's going to happen is I have had a background experience with it, so that background experience is going to change the way I think about it. So I don't even think I could drink a glass of milk, even if you paid me 100 bucks. I'm pretty sure I couldn't do it. Okay, now one of the most famous experiments is by John B. Watson. I'm going to post it in my watch list for this week. Um, if you weren't in class on Monday, please make sure you take a gander at it. It is when Albert is the baby who is going to be presented with all different types of furry animals. He's going to be fascinated. He's going to love it. Then all of a sudden we're going to condition him to fear uh, furry animals. And then he's going to generalize. What that generalizes is we're going to teach him to fear rats. And then he will expand his repertoire of fear to cats, dogs, bunnies, monkeys, all of those different types of things. Okay, so big, big, big experiment here in AP Psych. So you need to know John B. Watson, generalization with little Albert. Now, another classically conditioned thing is taste aversion. There is a reason why you don't like the things you like. Now, vicarious conditioning is when what's a classical conditioning concept of a reflex of an emotion by watching the reaction of another person. If someone else has a terribly overdramatic reaction to plums, for instance, then you are probably going to be like, oh my god, I'm not eating that. That is so disgusting. Okay? That is classical conditioning, okay? When you're using um, the experience of someone else to tell you what you do and don't like. Typically, you're going to adopt whatever your parents like or what your parents don't like. Now, conditioned taste aversion is when you develop nausea or aversive response to a particular taste because it was followed by a nauseous reaction. So there will be some time where you get really sick after eating something and you'll never eat again. For me, it's sour cream. <laughs> 
I got sick one Thanksgiving eating sour cream, and I've never touched it since, ever. And that includes onion dip, which is really sad, because I really love onion dip. But I will not go anywhere near it anymore. All right. So biological preparedness. Now, the reason why we have vicarious conditioning and condition of a taste aversion is because we need to survive. Now, learning is tied directly to our ability to survive. So we need to be able to learn quickly and move forward. We don't need to ask so many questions, hence why we have so many aversions to things. Now, why classical conditioning works is because of stimulus substitution. Okay, now he believes, Pavlov believes it because Pavlov believes that classical conditioning occurred because of the conditioned stimulus became a substitute for an unconditioned stimulus, but because they're paired together, which means that um, the dog didn't respond to the food because he responded to the bell, which meant food. So he's just swapping out one for the other. Now, the cognitive perspective believes classical conditioning is seen to occur because the conditioned stimulus provides information or an expectancy that the dog has learned that the bell is going to be a single a is a heads up signal that the food is coming. So both of those. All right. So classical conditioning is done. So fears. Pavlov, the dog's drooling, all of those things, generalization, John B. Watson, all of those fall into uh, classical conditioning. So close the book on that. Now we're talking about operant conditioning, two completely, totally separate things. It is good to be able to compare them, and you'll have to be able to do that. However, operant conditioning and classical conditioning are two separate things. So let's figure out what operant conditioning is about. Opera conditioning is the learning of a voluntary behavior. Remember, classical conditioning is elicited. It's done without thinking. This is done by choice. Um, through the effects of a pleasant or unpleasant consequence, which means we're choosing to do something because we want the reward or we're avoiding something else. Now, Thorndike is the foundation of it. Now, Thorndike comes up with the law of effect. There are very few things in psychology that are laws which means it is proven time and 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 time, and time again. E.L. Thorndike's law of effect is one of those things. Now, he believes, and it's true, that it's a, it's a law that states the response is followed by a pleasurable consequences. It'll tend to be repeated again. If it is followed by negative consequences, it will not be repeated. So, when you're trying to get someone to do things for you, if they have a good time doing it, they'll do it again. If they're absolutely miserable doing it for you, it'll never happen again. That is what E.L. Thorndike teaches you. If you're trying to manipulate someone, do it so they'll have a good time while doing it. So if your sister's kicking up all of your shoes, you do a little clap, you sing a little song and say, yay, Kimmy, yay, Kimmy, and then she'll keep doing it because she's having fun and she gets the positive reinforcement. If you're doing it while laughing at her and making fun of her, it's not going to work. You have to make sure she's having fun. <laughs> all right, so the graph of Thorndike's is just proving the number of trials is going to ha happen and all that stuff. Now, E.L. Thorndike and his law of effect is going to lay down the foundation. There's a gentleman named B.F. Skinner who's going to take this law of effect, and he is then going to turn around and put some science to it. Now, he's a behaviorist, which means he does not care about thinking theories like cognition. He wants to see um, observable behaviors. So he creates scenarios that allow him to see creative scenario, uh, physical scenarios being done, and those are going to be called the Skinner boxes, which we'll get to. Now, um, he wanted to study me uh, measurable behavior, and he gave operant conditioning its name because operant means voluntary. Everyone who is doing operant conditioning is doing it because they choose. Classical conditioning is being done because it's been elicited. Now, learning depends on the after, after the response, the consequence. Is it a positive consequence? Is it a negative consequence? Okay. Now, in class, I'm going to show you a bunch of Skinner boxes and stuff like that, a bunch of scenarios, which are pretty cool. Um, but it's all about testing rats and mice, and even chickens were even tested. So I got a bunch of them. Now, the major component of... Um, Operant conditioning is reinforcement. Now, the reinforcement is any event or stimulus that following a, that when following a response increases the probability of that response occurring again. What that means is, is that if you have a positive response, you're probably going to get more, okay? And you can have negative responses, so people are going to do it to avoid it. Reinforcement is what happens after 
the learning has been done and that's going to dictate whether it's done or not. Now a primary reinforcer is going to be any reinforcer that is naturally reinforcing by meeting a basic need. So that's your food, sex, and water. So if I dangle in front of you pizza, it's technically a primary reinforcer. Now if you were starving to death and I dangled pizza in front of you, it'd be a lot more motivating. Um, but still pretty effective today in 2015 um, in my classroom. If you gave me pizza, I'd be very happy. So primary <laughs> reinforcer. Now the next one is secondary reinforcer, and these are typically what people resort to when they're trying to bribe children, adults, each other, whoever. Um, primary, uh, secondary reinforcer is your money, is your clothes, is your cars, is... You know, I'll do a favor for you if you do a favor for me. Those are all your uh, secondary reinforcers. Tokens, gold stars. Um, anytime you go on the wall for getting an A in my class, that's a secondary reinforcer. Now, positive and negative reinforcement are two totally different things, and you need to understand the difference, and a lot of kids have difficulties with this. Positive reinforcement is the reinforcement of a response by the addition or experiencing of a pleasurable stimulus. What that means is, if you do well in my class, you get a free scoop of ice cream. You're doing well in my class to get the free scoop of ice cream. If you get all A's, your parents give you $100. That's, primary, uh, that's a positive reinforcement. Okay? You're doing something to get something else, or you're doing something to earn something else. Okay? You're doing something for a pleasurable response. Negative reinforcement is reinforcement of a response by the removal or escape from. If you don't get an A in my class, I punch you in the face. You're going to get an A in my class, so you don't get punched in the face. You're going to clean up your room, so you don't get punished. You're going to make it home by curfew, so you don't get grounded. You're going to be polite to your mom, so you don't get yelled at. Those are all negative reinforcement. You're doing something to avoid something else. Now, when we, take, um, when we take learning, we don't just throw people into the trenches and be like, oh my god, learn this stuff. We do a lot of things called shaping. Now, shaping is the reinforcement of a simple step in behavior that has led to a desired or more complex behavior. Now, if you think about my classroom, from day one, I'm shaping you into the students I want to deal with on a regular basis and not the students I inherit. Um, my choice of words, my behaviors, and my structures in my classroom dictate this. I want you to be silent during your do-now. I want your do-nows to be collaborative experiences when my students go over them. So I teach you how to do these things. I'm all over your case about being quiet. I am calling on a student. I'm modeling certain behaviors, and I'm showing you how to do it. Then I pick on a student to do it. Then I model them, then support them. And then eventually you guys can do it without me. The very beginning, I gave you all the answers to the quizzes. Now I'm not giving you the answers to the quizzes. I'm depending on you. I'm shaping your behavior every single day in class to make you a better student for my system. And that's exactly what it is. Now, when we deal with shaping, it's every time behavior is learned to teach you something else. I'm teaching you this so I can teach you that. That's called shaping. Now, successive approximations are small steps in behavior, one after another, that lead to a particular goal of behavior. You can't teach, you know, Blackfin over here to jump through a hoop when it goes against all of their natural instincts. You have to shape them. You have to break their spirit and do all these terrible things to them, and then they'll eventually do it. It's called shaping and successive approximation. Okay? So, now other operant conditioning concepts is extinction, of course, same thing like classical conditioning. Um, at some point, when you do leave my class, you will forget all the little nuances. You'll remember your number. People will remember that. But people don't always necessarily remember the little steps of, you know, going over the do now and stuff like that, not until it's re re reminded to them. Um, operant condition responses also can be generalized to a certain stimuli or only to original stimulus. What that means is, is typically when kids come back into my class, they start remembering like, oh my god, Miss Bennett, my number, oh my god, it was 409, and all this stuff. They remember all this information that I've taught them and I shaped with them, and that's kind of generalized information at this point. Like, they kind of like pull the information through and stuff like that, and they kind of make, they say, oh my god, this happens in your class, and I'm like, no, no, it didn't. And they're like, no, yes, 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 it did, Miss Bennett. I'm like, no, it didn't. And they're like, oh my god, you're right, it didn't happen in this class, but I feel like it did. And I was like, that's called generalization. Okay? So, 
spontaneous recovery is the reoccurrence of one's distinguished response. I have a lot of kids who um, come back into my class and I collect papers in front of them and they're like, oh my God, Miss Bennett, can I organize them for you by number? And I'm like, absolutely. Spontaneous recovery. <laughs> they have the need to put things in alphabetical order. Okay, so when we're dealing with conditioning response, this is a really nice chart that compares operant conditioning to classical conditioning. The biggest difference between the two is that classical conditioning is elicited. You have to do it. There's no thinking. You just do it. Operant conditioning is selection. You want to do it. You know what to do because you either want something or you're avoiding something. Now, when we typically deal with learning, a huge part of it is punishment. Now, punishment is any event or object when following response that makes the response less likely to happen again. Now remember, negative reinforcement is when you're doing something to avoid. You're typically avoiding punishment. Like for instance, you get home on time from curfew not to get punished. No one stays out after curfew saying, oh, I can't wait to be punished. Punishment is to um, stop you from doing things that you're not supposed to be doing. Now, punishment by, there's two types of punishment. Punishment by application is the first, and it's punishment of a response and the addition of experiencing an unpleasant stimuli. My mother's favorite thing. My mom used to make me do chores around the house for a month, which means I had to do the dishes every single night, I had to take out all the trash for the entire house, and I had to fold everybody's laundry for the whole month when I was grounded. And I was grounded a lot, so I became very good at doing laundry. I hate laundry, but I was very good at it. That's punishment by application. Punishment by removal is a punishment of response by the removal of a pleasurable stimulus. So for instance, if you learn, lost TV for a month, if you lost your cell phone for a month, if you lost um, your right to go out and see your friends, that is punishment by removal. So punishment by application is you have to do something in addition to your norm, and punishment by removal is you get things taken away. Okay? So um, these are just examples of punishments and approval and all that stuff. So four ways to modify. The most, in, uh, the most influential is going to be your positive or adding reinforcement. So positive reinforcement, this is a great chart, is adding something valued or desirable. Punishment would be adding something unwanted. Uh, for instance, uh, for positive reinforcement is getting a gold star, well, punishment would be getting a spanking for disobeying. Those are the types of things that would be an example of. Now, how to make punishment more effective? Um, this is a good thing for your future kids. I would not tell your parents about this because your parents are just going to enrage your parents more. I've had a kid tell his parents that he was punishing them wrong and it did not go well, so keep that in mind. Now, when you are punishing, more, to make punishment more effective, punishment should be immediately follow the behavior it's meant to punish. So if you have a dog and the dog poops on the floor and you punish him an hour later after he poops, the dog's not going to learn his damn lesson. He's not. He, he doesn't know why he's being punished. He was just sitting on the floor. You happen to find his poop, but he did that an hour ago, so he's forgotten it. Now, punishment should be consistent. If you find your dog has pooped on the floor, you need to do the same punishment over and over again immediately after. So he under starts understanding that, oh, okay, if I do this, this is what happens to me. You can't be inconsistent. It has to be consistent for order to work. Your third is punishment of the wrong behavior should be paired whenever possible with reinforcement of the right behavior. You'll probably get really annoyed with this about your parents because it's really hard to do. Every time you do something wrong, you feel like your parents notice it. Every time you do something right, you feel like they never notice it. That's what we're talking about here. Um, I try to notice positive behavior in my classroom. In case you haven't noticed, I always say, hey, you know, if you're not doing your do now, now, you know, you should really get going. You know, hey, you know, um... Susie Q is doing her do now, why aren't you doing your do now, all those types of things. Um, instead of just yelling at kids who are not, I'm trying to support those kids who are doing. Now, when we talk about reinforcement, we're dealing with schedules, and this is one of the harder parts of... <clears throat> of learning. Now schedules of reinforcement, uh, there's partial reinforcement, which means a tendency of the response to be reinforced after some, but not all. So sometimes you get a treat, sometimes you don't. 
Um, continuous reinforcement means every time you get a correct response, you get a treat. So an example of partial reinforcement would be every, like, seventh time maybe you get one. Continuous reinforcement is every time you get a question right, you get a treat. So there's fixed ratio and there's variable. Fixed means it's the same thing every time. Variable means it changes. So fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement is when it's the same number of responses required for reinforcement is always the same. So every fifth time you get a cookie. That's called a fixed ratio. So every time you hit the little button, you get a treat every fifth time. So you have to hit the button, one, two, three, four, five, you get a treat. So one, two, three, four, five, you get a treat. One, two, three, four, five, you get a treat. Now, variable interval is when the schedule of reinforcement in which the interval of time that must pass before reinforcement is different for each trial. When you see variable interval, it's time-based. So as long as the button has been hit, there's a certain amount of time that changes. For instance, if I hit the button, I may get it in three seconds. One, two, three, treat. I hit the button again, it may take five seconds. One, two, three, four, five, treat. Interval means time-based, waiting time. When you see ratio, it means how many times the button was hit. That's a big key thing that a lot of kids kind of get confused on. Now, fixed interval schedule is a reinforcement schedule in which the interval of time is the same. So every three seconds, one, two, three, treat. One, two, three, treat. Okay? Um, every time you hit it over a certain amount of time, you get a treat. Your next one is variable ratio. So depending on how many times you hit, so the first time you may have to hit it only twice, then you have to hit it three times, then you get a treat, then you hit it ten times you get a treat, twelve times you get a treat, it always consistently changes. Variable ratio. Now, the best type of reinforcement is going to be continuous. Continuous is going to have the kids going, but eventually, as soon as you stop, it totally drops off. Okay. Now, when we deal with operant stimulus and stimulus control, we deal with discriminative stimulus or any stimulus such as a stop sign or a doorknob that provides the organism with a cue for making a certain response in order to retain. So, when we have discriminative stimulus is like a stop sign, we know what we're, what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to stop at the stop sign. We know we're supposed to open the doorknob. Okay. Now, behavior resistant to conditioning is, an, is called instinctive drift. What that means is it's a tendency for an animal's behavior to revert to genetically controlled patterns. What that means is, is that there are some responses that simply cannot be trained into animals regardless of conditioning. Like, no matter what, we will not be able to train a raccoon to sit at a table and eat with a fork and knife. We just can't. And there's also some humans we can't. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I mean sometimes. Okay, so just depending on what type of behaviors you're trying to do will allow instinct drift and some will not. Now when we deal with behavior modification, we're dealing with operant conditioning. If you think about the zoos, if you think about SeaWorld and all that stuff, what they're doing with behavior modification is they're using treats or food or primary reinforcers to motivate those animals to do whatever they're supposed to be doing. They're also using negative reinforcement. Um, for instance, with, an with elephants, they use a thing called elephant hook, which really hurts the animals. So the animals are going to do the trick just so they don't get the elephant hook. Okay, now this is used to bring about desired change. Now, we use, on humans, no elephant hooks because it was really hurt, um, would be token economy, which means we bribe you. Do you remember in elementary school, you, get to, you used to get like gold stars or little tokens or Bennett's bucks? Okay, and you could spend it on these really tacky, cheap toys in the bin in your little treasure chest. That's called a token economy. Um, we're also going to see uh, timeouts, which your parents probably loved. Now, when you're dealing with um, timeouts, it's a form of punishment by removal in which a misbehaving animal, a child, or adult, <laughs> I would love to see an adult on timeout, by the way, um, is placed in a special area away from the attention of others where they can cool out. Now, what, why it's effective is because it's removed from any, positive, any ability to have positive reinforcement in form of attention. When, and the best thing you can do is when someone is being ridiculous and is just driving you crazy, is just to shut down their ability to fuel 
um, with the attention. So that's why we use timeouts. Now, finally, we also can use uh, applied behavior analysis which is a modern term for a form of behavior modification, which uses shaping to mold desired behavior responses. Typically, you use that with one another and your friends, <laughs> whether you know it or not. You'll use it with your future wives and husbands. Um, I, want my, my, I want McCray to do certain things. He does them to make me happy. He, I do certain things to make him happy. Like, I know he likes having a clean house, so I try to keep it clean. It doesn't usually work. He knows that I love flowers, so he buys me flowers every week for putting up with his mess. <laughs> so, beh applied behavior analysis is we simply do things to make ourselves and the uh, people around us easier. So, that's called shaping. Now, biofeedback and neurofeedback. Biofeedback is the use of feedback about our biological conditions to bring voluntary responses, such as blood pressure and relaxation under voluntary control. Typically, when you're really upset, you're just like, just breathe, Sam. Just breathe. That's called biofeedback. You know when you are getting hot from an anger and you're just like, oh my god, I have to calm myself down before I lose my mind on this child. That's called biofeedback. We typically learn from negative experiences. For me, I learned that I can't say everything that comes to my head. Even though it's really funny in my head, I can't say it out loud. I learned that in middle school because not everyone thinks my jokes are funny, and I learned that. And it was really, they took it really hard. Even though it was a really funny joke, she did not appreciate it, and I lost a friendship. So I learned I can't say whatever I want to say. And I have to, you know, try to process that information. Now, another form is called neurofeedback, which is a form of biofeedback using brain scanning devices to provide feedback about brain activity and effort to modify behavior. What that is is that we're looking at different parts of your brain in order to see what part of your brain is being triggered by that certain response. So... Anyway, an interesting week. Auburn conditioning, you definitely need to know Thorndike, BF Skinner. Um, those are the two big giants there. We're going to do a little bit more work with these uh, with Auburn conditioning coming up next week, but a strong week nonetheless. Keep in mind that you need to know Pavlov and you need to know um, John B. Watson for classical conditioning and, of course, little Albert. Anyway, hope you guys are having a great week. I can't believe we're through nine. Only, you know, three more quarters to go. Just kidding. Anyway, have a great week. See ya.